If you got Bibles, go to Genesis 27 real quick. Don't want to take long, but I want to show you something important. I'll tell you, Genesis 27, 41, uh, they have just tricked Esau. They've just tricked Isaac into giving the blessing to, I mean, to Jacob. Isaac's really mad. It says Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the, the, the blessing which his father had given him. And Esau, listen, Esau said to himself, he said to himself, you know, what do we call that? Inner dialogue, right? If you've got your Bibles, go back just a couple pages to chapter 17, verse 17. This is Abraham. God has just told Abraham that he's 99, Sarah's 90, that, God, that he said, you and Sarah are going to have a baby. So Genesis 17, 17, and then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and, and said in his heart. What do we call that? Inner dialogue. Go over to chapter 18. Look at, start with verse 12. God has just again reiterated this promise that Sarah's going to have a baby at 90. Verse Let's look at verse, the end of verse 10, Sarah was listening at the door. Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. Sarah laughed within herself in her dialogue. And after, she said, after I become old, shall I have the pleasure, uh, I have the pleasure. We're not sure whether she's talking about having the child or anyway. My Lord also being old, and the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? So the Lord heard her inner dialogue, right? She laughed within herself, so the Lord heard that. This is where you get Jesus saying, if you lusted in your heart, you've committed adultery type idea. So what I want to say, two things before we get to this sheet. One, uh, freedom of speech. That's a bedrock of American government, freedom of speech. Listen, freedom of speech is freedom of thought because thought is speech. It's inner speech. And if you don't have the freedom to say stupid stuff so you can hear it and other people can correct you and go, no, and your stupid stuff and my stupid stuff can't compete and we can both find the better, then you can't think. You can't think. So, secondly, you're thinking, I don't know if you're aware of your own inner dialogue. I would, people come to me and I've got this problem, I've got that problem. We talk about it, we talk about the theory and why people are the way they are today based on choices they made yesterday. Well, what do I do? How do I start to work my way out of this place I'm in? First thing I say is start listening to what you're saying to yourself. Start listening. Because the reason you feel the way you do is because of what you're saying to yourself. And if you're telling yourself biblical truths, that's going to make you feel strong and powerful and confident and good. But if you're telling yourself cosmic lies, if you're telling yourself things that aren't true based on God's Word, that's going to lead you into a very bad place. So, as a preface, if you'll, if you, if you'll look at your sheet, does everybody have a sheet? Okay, first of all, there's a delusion that is common among mankind. And that is, if I can get what I want, I will be happy. I say if you can get what you've decided to want, because we don't just want, everybody doesn't want the same thing. You know why? Because we decide what we're going to want. What we believe will 
give us happiness. But getting, here's a delusion that getting what I want through luck, success, the lottery, or even God's blessing will produce happiness in my life. It might for a moment. It might for a moment. But listen, happiness, what we call happiness, which is emotional pleasure of the moment, is really not that big of a goal to pursue. How about this? How about becoming what you're designed to be and then living out your divine purpose daily? Coming to understand God's plan for your life and what you're designed to be and become entering into the process of developing that, becoming that person, and living that out. Wait. The roof's coming down. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> That's great. So, first of all, I'm trying to share a model with you. I'm trying to share a model. If you look at the first principle... God created mankind with an empty place, representing the needs in the inner part of, your, of yourself, your inner being, and we experience this as desires. Now, I'm going to draw this up here, like so, and this is the core of your being. This is John 7, the innermost being from which, out of which froze lip flows rivers of living water. Jesus said, this is where your hunger and thirst come from, this inner place. My belief is that this inner place is in all of us, and it's what drives us to find someone. See, here's a desire for love, uh, approval, acceptance, for respect, we all hunger for these things, okay? So that hunger is in you. Jesus had that same human hunger. Those things are legitimate needs that produce that desire. He attached his hunger to God the Father and God the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. He attached his hunger See, here's faith, hope, love. He attached his faith to meet the needs of his heart to God. And therefore, because he attached to God, he built his ideas and the way he inter interacted in his life all based on the word of God, based on truth. What did that produce in his life? The best possible. Perfect life. Perfect sacrifice to the Father. Unconditional love. He was a giver, not a taker, right? Now, and this is the first couple of points here. Mankind who is born in Adam, separated from God, we don't have that option. When you're a little kid trying to find someone to give you love and approval and respect and, and meet your needs and nurture you, take care of you, you don't have God. You can't get to God. You can't understand God's Word. God is not an option. So we turn to people. The question, again, people come and say, I know that God is my answer, but I still want the people or this person in my life more than I want anything else. I know it's not true. I know it's not real. How do I get myself to want God more than I want this person? Of course, that's what we call spiritual growth. The better question is, how is it I got to this place how is it that we all got to this place where we want people and they're our primary source, at least in our mind, instead of God? How did that happen? Well, listen, you were born separated from God and you built all of your beliefs, one little belief at a time, 
That's what we call a belief system. Faith, believing that people had what you needed. It's the, all you, it's the only option you had. You follow that? Okay. Good. Y'all ready for lunch? So, first point, first point, by design, God has created man with an empty place. Christ, this empty place is the place where our desires come from. Where does desire come from? Why do you desire this or that? The better question is, why do you desire it all? What's well, because you have needs that God built into you? The question is, what are you going to attach those needs to? Legitimate needs. Let's see, as a believer, let me give you another little thing. Here you are, you're a believer, and you have built this old, what I call, or Paul called this old man system, the old self. Christ built this new man system. So here you are as a believer with these desires. Now, you, we think we're just dead in the middle. See, as long as you're filled with the Spirit, you are free from that. You are in this sphere. And you're free to act in that sphere. Unhindered. The moment you let go of the Spirit, the second you let go of the Spirit, this old system that has been your system all your life, you wonder, why do I keep going back? Why do I keep going back? Why do I keep going back? You turned that into your habit of life long ago. See, it's more than an old sin nature. It's a whole way of, of thinking about life. It, it's a whole way of life that says, me first. What I want is first. What I want is necessary. I've got to have it, and, I've got to, and I can only get it from people. See, that's the cosmic system. You say, well, I, I don't care about people. I want success. I want things. Yeah, you want things so that you can press people. Okay, anyway, so here you are as a believer. Look, you can stay filled with the Spirit and attach all of your legitimate desires for whatever, for food, for love, for approval, for sex, for right over here in the new man, and you're right in God's will. But if you attach those desires to anything outside of God's will, now you're moving downhill. Now you're moving in the wrong direction. Jesus, the first principle here is that Jesus, I think I can erase, Jesus, Jesus only did the new man. He only did the new man. He never, he never believed anything out of the cosmic system. He never believed anything that wasn't true from the Word of God. He never attached himself to anyone but, the, but his heavenly Father. That's what it means to be perfect. So, so that's Jesus. The second point is that at, born in Adam, we attach ourselves again, to people, to the world, and we develop our systems for developing approval and love and acceptance from people. It's all about people. All right? Uh, I saw a famous psychologist was talking about this personality test, which is of interest to mind, that extroversion was equal to happiness. Now, I know I just spoke Greek to y'all, but what he says is that happiness comes from interacting properly with a bunch of other humans. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, that sounds great if you have a human-centered belief system. If your belief system says humans can make you happy, then yeah, connecting with other humans is your way of happiness. But that's not, that's not how it works. See, the universe is, is the universe people-centered? But the, no, it's God-centered. So, so there's the two systems. Thirdly, our sin nature, see, you're born with this old sin nature. 
this bent away from God. You were made, we were made bent toward God, but sin has bent us away from God. Independence, self, me, me. Look, not just me, but me. So, the sin nature fits this old system, this cosmic system that says people are the answer. We believe that. We develop human logic that we consistently use. What's important to understand is that, is that in developing this logic, you started out as a little kid and you attached to your mom or your dad or whoever, your, your siblings and then your peers. You remember when peers became so important? And then one day you met a boy or a girl and you're like, whoa. And one day you got married and you went, oh. <laughs> you learned a lot. But, uh, and then you had kids and you're like, oh, I'm in love. People-centered. Your life is people. And listen, it is true. Your life is people. But in service to the Lord to people. Not as, not as your source for your needs. As an overflow. See, the rivers of living water that come from God and fill you up need to go to people. That's service to people. But, so, what happens, we, we develop all of our relational strategies, the way that we operate, the way that we believe, the way that we think, and we turn all of these ways Let's say you got a really good personality. You're outgoing and you're attractive and you're really fun to be around and that works for you. Well, you lean on that. You develop that and you use that as your way of getting people to like you. See, that's, that's you getting people. Well, you develop that system of being attractive and fun and See, I, I really had to use other things myself, but uh, sports, being smart, things like that. I'm still trying to develop those, by the way. But we develop these beliefs, and listen, we turn it into an automatic program so that when you let go of the Spirit, you go, over, you go back over to the old way of thinking and you have, you have programs already in place that you have been using all your life that just come right back online. You get in conflict with someone that you love, someone that, say, norm, say you normally, hey, we get along good, we're over here in the new man, we're walking in the Lord, walking in the Spirit, but we have conflict. So now I've chosen to sin. There's a logic behind my sin and I'm out of fellowship. You don't go over here and create some new way of fighting. You've got your old way of fighting and you've been using that way of fighting. Either you use self-pity or self-righteousness or I'm gonna blame you. You got your systems already in place. Where did those come from? You programmed them. All through your life, you programmed them. They're automatically there until you tear them down, remove them. That's, that's my belief, but not everybody believes that. Where do your, see, the question I'm trying to answer for all of us is where do our repetitive sin problems come from? Why do we keep committing the same sin over and over again? Did you know the inside of your body is the Holy Spirit who raised, who, who the power of the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Created the universe. Did you know inside most of you is a whole list of principles of the Word of God that you've been putting in there for years and years and years? Those two powers are eternal. Can't be stopped, can't be beat. Nothing the devil can do can stop the Holy Spirit or the Word of God. Seems like inside of me ought to be blasting out divine virtue, right? I mean, I ought to be shining like the sun, but I'm not. I'm grumpy, and I'm difficult. Those of you that know me. <laughs> I mean, 
That's my tendency. That's this stuff. The more that I confront that and not let it be in charge of me anymore, the more I'm free to let the Spirit love. And that's where we want to go. So, repetitive sin patterns come from this programming. See, it's not just, think about this. Many of you spent many years in doctrine. You developed, you've grown, you've got this ministry you love. You love your family. You love the, you love the Lord. You've got this thing going on. And then somehow you stop and just this old nature grabs a hold of you and turns you into a Mr. Nasty for a little while. Now listen, it's more than a nature. It is a nature. But it's a nature that we have turned into patterns, systems. And those have to be, you, you gotta, if you want to break the repetitive sin, I would confess my sin. A little while later, I'd be right back to that sin. Lord, rescue me. Confess my sin. A little while later, I'd be right back to the sin. Lord, rescue me. He'd be like, listen, you're choosing to think the logic that says that sin is the right thing to do or the reasonable thing to do. Listen, our repetitive sins have a root cause. Anger, fear, apathy, pretense, deception. It's more than just a selfish nature. It's a false idea in logic that says that that sin is justified. Don't tell me I shouldn't be angry and upset and bitter toward my mate. Don't tell me that. I've got all kinds of reasons for that. Right? You're justified. See, we don't just sin out of the blue. We have a reason for it. We believe that over here, apart from the will of God, is something that's going to satisfy this hunger in us. And the logic says yes. So we practice self-deception and entitlement into habitual thoughts and behavior patterns. Cre listen, creating circular cycles in relationships. Now, as someone who does a lot of counseling, I see, and, and as someone who has relationships, believe it or not, I see patterns of behavior that go in cycles. Boom, right back. Why do we keep going through this cycle? Once you've been doing it for a while, you can start to track it. I'm not sure how far to go, but when I got married, I asked Rhonda, I said, honey, some days you really like me. They're rare, but some days you really like me. And then it's like a week later, you can take or leave me, and then the next week, I'm better off to go fishing. She said, come here. And she got out the calendar. You girls know where I'm going? And she said, this week, I'm ovulating, and I love you. The next week, all that's going away, and I'm okay. And the next week, I really would like to murder you in your sleep. <laughs> okay? And I'm just holding off. Changed my whole life. Everything made sense. Cycles. Do you not have cycles in your, relation, in your relationships? Of course you do. You develop those, you built those, you, you built those throughout your life. They interfere with your freedom to let the Spirit work through you. This is Al doing Al. Not me being free to let the Spirit do Jesus. So, self-deception. Is our cosmic beliefs creating this false interpretation and logic? And out of that comes irrational expectations. Let me give you just a few areas where we deceive ourselves. One, very common today, is that biology is reality. 
Now, lest you get, think this doesn't apply to you, oh boy. First of all, people say, I hear this a lot. This is me. This is my personality. I came out of the womb this way. I've been this way my whole life. Take me or leave me. Accept me the way I am. You know what my answer to that is? No. Grow up in Christ. How about that? How about the way that you am ain't anywhere near the way God wants you to be? So stop thinking just because you came out this way, I'm supposed to be this way. Now, inherit, we do have inherited biological tendencies. Some people inherit anger, tendencies toward violence or anxiety or fear. Addictiveness, they think, is inherited tendencies. Carolyn Leaf, the Christian brain science, she thinks homosexuality, when practiced in previous generations, possibly is passed down the tendency for it into another generation. I'm like, oh, I don't know. You say no. I say yes. It's not that you inherited the tendency. <laughs> it's what you do with it. I mean, I inherited a tendency. My, my mother's family were all bootleggers. So every time I pass a hardware store, I start looking at copper pots. <laughs> <laughs> copper tubing, I'm thinking, hmm. You inherit stuff. Doesn't mean you have to do it. That God's will says, okay, you inherited that, that's how you came out, so just be that. See, that's false. So I was born this way, so God or nature must have made me this way. So this is how I'm supposed to live. That's false. Secondly, again, getting what we have decided to want will make me happiness. And listen, here's the next part of that. And that happiness is the proper goal for me to pursue. Happiness. The proper goal for you to pursue is to, just, is to become who you have been made to be in Christ and pursue fulfillment through spiritual development, fulfilling your divine design to seek meaning and purpose. Listen, seek meaning and purpose. Also, people think if I can get everything I want, if I had all the money in the world, I, everything would be great. You know what happens to very rich people? What happens to celebrities? Is they get in a position where nobody tells them no. Nobody pushes back. Nobody tells them, you're being a jerk. You know, you're, you're boring. You know, nobody pushes back. And therefore, they go off the rails. You need somebody in your life to push back and go, Stop. Stop. You're being selfish. All the conflict in your life, conflict is a wonder. I did a study last year called Using Conflict to Become Compatible. It's a marriage study. Conflict is your friend if you use it properly. It shows you so many things that God's trying to teach you. Conflict is good. Thirdly, another delusion is people... We believe that people actually possess what we need to fill our empty hearts. We think people actually have it. And so we hound them to the ends of the earth to try to get it from them. And we truly believe the only reason that they don't just roll over and give it to us is that they're selfish. But you know what the real truth is? They don't have it. I love these videos of these little short videos on YouTube where they, the dog, you know, they throw the ball up, they throw the ball up, and they throw the ball up, and the dog's like, that's most people in relationships. I know that you have what I need to make my heart joyful 24-7. I know you have it. It's just you're too selfish to give it to me. 
You're too selfish to roll over and be exactly what I want you to be all the time. And so fulfill my idea. You see how silly that is? That's called marriage counseling. Let me give you something else. I got this from Carolyn Leaf also. Every time that you complain, every time you describe your mate, let's say your mate, and you complain and you talk about all the things they do or all things they don't do, every time you do that in your mind, you make that more real. You make that more solid. You make that less able to change. You turn that into reality. Don't do that anymore. If you need to come and complain, come and I'll listen to you complain once or twice, and then I'm going to say, stop doing that. You're just digging a deeper rut. It's not helping you. Because what are you doing with your inner dialogue? You're telling yourself these negative things. Listen, they might even be true, but listen, who wants to... I've got a saying, love is greater than truth. You might, be, you might be telling the truth about your partner, but what is more important than telling the truth about your partner is, is loving your partner and helping your partner grow out of those truths. How is it that you're a force in their life that's helping them grow out of these, this selfishness? Listen, I need help. I need help. I need, I need my partner to help me, not just criticize me. So, we think people have it, and we think that, <laughs> here's another thing. We think if we say it the right way, in the right moment, and with the right look, dressed in the right way, in the right setting, somehow we can turn people into the source to fill our hearts. We think it's up to me. See, again, that's just human-centered thinking. It's conditional thinking, too. It's not grace. One of the greatest moments in my life. I was sweeping the floor feeling that I wasn't loved. I could feel that. I'm like, I'm not loved. Now, I know God loves me. I've been told that. But I don't feel that, so I'm sweeping the floor. And the Holy Spirit said, you know why you don't feel loved by God? Because you think God's, you still think God's supposed to love you because of something about you. Something you've done or not done. Something you are, you aren't. And he said, God doesn't love like that. God loves Christ. And you're in Christ. So God loves you because you're in Christ. You don't need to bring your offerings to God to get him to love you. But that's what we do with each other. We bring our offerings, either it's, either it's the whip or the carrot or the persuasion or whatever. Listen, listen, because we still believe people are the answer. And people's love and respect and esteem is the answer. I gotta get it before I die. Somebody's gotta love me the way I wanna be loved. Because if you're honest with you, you've gone through your whole life and you've had some great loves, but none of it's fulfilled your heart because it can't. It can't. This life is not going to be that way. You're not gonna get that in this life from people. That's self deception. That's what I'm trying to share. So the inevitable result of failing to make people into gods, which is what we're talking about, that are able and willing to meet our needs is, dis is, is disappointment, disillusionment, depression, self-depreciation, and defenses. I've done these little, these little polls, these little questionnaires. People come and talk, and I go, if you could say, just generally speaking, what you feel like most of the time. What would be your word? Depressed. Discouraged. Disappointed is like the number one answer. Dis what disappointed? 
they, my life has just not bec- turned out the way I thought it should or thought it would or why, the way I wanted it to turn out. wonder why. Well, maybe the way you thought it should turn out was maybe not the way God designed it to work. Is that fair? And they go, yeah, probably so. That's what we're talking about here is when you think people are your answer, you're going to always end up disappointed because people are not your answer. God is your answer. So the focus of your spiritual growth is to develop the knowledge and then the, the applications in your life to let people be where they're supposed to be, which is really a relief. When you quit thinking they're supposed to provide you what only God can give you, man, you can let them off the hook. (laughs) Isn't that nice? Come here, Rhonda. Fill my heart like God. She's like, yeah, right. I'll fill your heart like God. I'll fill your heart like God with a shovel or a pickaxe or something. So, yeah. Yeah. When our false plan to make our own gods out of people doesn't work, we blame ourselves. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't handsome enough. Didn't have enough money. Didn't have a good enough personality. Something was wrong with me. That's why I couldn't hook this beautiful person, woman, whatever, and make all that work the way I wanted it. It was my fault. So when we believe that, see, we believe the lie that it's supposed to work in the first place. Then we tell another lie that said it's my fault. Then we tell another lie that says if I spruce up, if I start going to the gym, if I lose some weight, if I have a face transplant, uh, (laughs) if I have a personality transplant, something, then maybe she'll like me. She gets out the calendar again and says, yeah, that week I will. Anyway, I'm saying this because I want you to understand and then we'll quit. We've, We've gone through our life. See, we were born into this. We didn't intend to make people our primary source. We didn't mean to do that. Nobody, nobody woke up in the womb and said, when I come out, I'm going to reject God and make people into my gods. We're born into that. We don't really have a choice much in it. Technically, we choose it, and so we're responsible, but we don't really have a choice. And so we end up there with this way of thinking, and we're not really sure. And so we end up hurt. We fail a lot in our life because the premise that we're operating on doesn't work. And so we blame ourselves. And so we go through it again and again and again, trying to make it work. And it just, so the point I'm trying to make is we use defenses to try to live with that reality that I have screwed it up. I've messed it up. We go numb. We pretend that it's greater than it is. We use what's called denial. We just don't think about it. That's what, that's my favorite when people come. I had a lady the other day, she came and she's really in trouble and making some bad decisions. And so I just tried to be honest with her about it and confront her. I mean, you can't pay your rent because you're spending all your money on these things. Well, I don't like to think about that. I like to think on the positive side. And I thought, well, (laughs) there's a solution. You're wasting all your money and you can't pay your bills. And so rather than confront the situation and honestly tell the truth about it, you just rather deceive yourself, right? Let's just be happy. Here's the the deal, and I'll close. In Christ, if you were to confront these problems and everything you have and apply the Word of God to them, you know what you would discover? That God has already won that. And that there's a million reasons to be happy. 
and you don't have to pretend or practice self-deception. Father, thank you so much for this church and thank you so much for believers who are willing to listen. And I pray for believers. I pray that we all are willing to apply these things to our life, to look honestly at ourselves. Uh, for those that are hurting in here this morning, if there's someone here who's struggling, if there's someone here who's never trusted in Christ, I pray, Father, that you'll give them clarity of the gospel. And you'll give us clarity, Father, of your word about how to conduct ourselves to be free of the lies, to live in the truth. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.